okay. Oh, looks like timing's pretty much perfect. Okay, so S4. Um, so first off, um, S4 provides a formal approach to functional OOP. So uh, um, that immediately reminds me of formal poo. Um, so yeah, so basically there, so S4 and S3 are both uh, this kind of functional uh, OOP approach where you're um, defining classes that contain the data and define how data is stored, and then linking those classes to methods uh, through generics. Um, and we'll, it, S4 kind of um, organizes this, this a lot more than, than S3 does. So, uh, so it's methods dispatched by generics and the, the signature of the arguments or the, or the class of the arguments. Um, S4 introduces the slot, which is a named component of the object that's uh, accessed using the uh, the at symbol. Um, so, as is often the case with OOP and R, this is this is and should be hidden behind the scenes uh, and shouldn't be a user facing thing. Um, we'll get to that a little bit more later. But uh, so the methods package provides uh, um, most of the S4, well, actually all of the S4 stuff. Um, it's loaded by default in an interactive session. Um, it's good to, to uh, if you're writing a, a package or if you're writing a script that's deliberately using S, S4, it's good to um, do library methods just to tell people that that's what you're doing. Um, so the main functions that this provides for S4 objects are uh, um, the set class function for creating, instantiating, and validating classes. Um, it's a set class and a couple of other uh, functions that go with it. Uh, creating generics uh, with the set generic function. Uh, and then once you've created a generic, you can assign methods to it um, with the set method function. So first, a, a quick overview of how to generate S4 classes uh, and how to uh, um, use generics and methods with them. Um, so creating an S4 class, you use the set class function. Um, and so here we're creating a class named person. Uh, we're using the slots argument to tell it what slots that class should have for data. In this case, it's a, um, a name slot and an age slot. Um, and you uh, define the, the, uh, um, the data type of that slot. And this can be a, a base type like it is here, or a base class, uh, or it can be an S3 class, or it can be an S4 class uh, for, the, for the object types. Um, so now that we've uh, um, created our class, um, we can create a new instance of it with the new function. The new function is uh, is generated automatically. It's a generic, but it's generated automatically for your class when you do set class. So it's like a kind of behind, it's a side effect of the set class function. Um, the set class function also uh, produces a function for instantiating uh, your class, objects of your class, uh, but we'll get to that a little bit more later. It wasn't really discussed in the advanced R, so I'm thinking it might not be uh, um, best practice. So we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, okay, so for creating an instance, you can use this uh, um, automatically generated new function or the uh, a generic that now has a, a method for your person uh, class. So you can give it the, um, the slots as named uh, common separated things. Um, or you can uh, use this, the function that we've assigned the output of set class to. Um, so, okay, so now we've created a, an object of our class. Um, so we wanna look at that object. Um, so um, you'll, every, every class will have a default uh, uh, print method. So when you just type it on the command line, you get a, um, an output of what's in the class. Um, you can interrogate a class to say, you know, what are you? And if you ask, uh, ask who what it is, it'll return that it's a person. Um, and you can also test using the is function to say, is this object of class person? And we return true. Uh, basic data access is with the, uh, the at sign. Uh, so it's really similar to the dollar sign notation um, in that you're saying, OK, uh, I want the name, um, the name slot of my object poo. Um, and likewise with age, it's returning NA because we didn't give it an age. Um, so friends don't make friends use slot syntax for accessing objects. So uh, one of the first things you should do with a new uh, um, a new class is 
create some uh, setter and getter functions to uh, um, allow users to access your class without having to use the, um, the at sign notation. Um, in addition to being more what our users are, are familiar with um, and kind of hiding that OOP aspect behind, behind the scenes, it also allows you to, uh, um, to make them safe so that people can't do things that you might not want them to do with your object. Um, so first we'll create a generic um, called age um, and we're giving that a, an anonymous function that um, calls standard generic age. And all this is doing is, uh, um, is making a new generic function called age. And um, when you first create a generic, it has no methods associated with it. Uh, and we'll get to that just at the bottom of the slide. So this first one will be a, a function for getting the age from your, um, uh, from your object. And second one uh, with the assignment, it's the, uh, uh, oh, now I can't remember the name of it. It's not infix, it's the other one. From the functions chapter, uh, this notation allows you to use the, uh, um, the assignment. We'll, we'll see how that works a little bit lower down. Um, so, uh, so this is the same thing, it's just setting another generic um, that'll be the assignment for age. Um, and we have no methods associated with those when we, when we first instantiate them or when we first make them. Um, so we need to assign a method. Um, so to assign a method to our age generic for the person class, we say set method. Um, age is our, is our generic that we want to assign a method to. Person is the, is the class um, of the argument for which we want to assign a, uh, a method or a dispatch. Um, and here's the function that we're going to assign. Again, it's just an anonymous function that's calling the uh, on the age slot of our whatever you pass into it as a um, as an object. Um, similarly, with the setter function, we're saying okay for the age assignment generic um, and the a person object type, we're going to say that that's uh, um, a um, assign the value that's passed in to the object that's passed in. Um, and here's the body of that, that function. Um, so now we can say things like uh, um, the, uh, we can assign poo an age by saying age of poo, um, assign 95 to that. Um, so that's dispatching on um, the age generic and it's a, it knows that poo is a object of, of uh, class person so it's uh, um, calling this function here to actually execute the execute the call. Um, and again, same idea when we when we uh, say age of poo, it'll return ninety five because we're um, calling this generic and dispatching this function. So okay, so that was a really quick overview of the kind of way that uh, S four works. Uh, and then the rest of the chapter kind of goes into a little more detail on this. Um, oh yeah, thanks, Hannes. It's a replacement function. Um, okay, so S4 classes. So um, again, the set class calls the way to define classes. Uh, it's a little bit more detail here. So uh, there's, there are many arguments to a lot of these functions, but uh, the book kind of um, slims it down to only the ones that you really need to use and should kind of stick to unless you have a real reason not to. Uh, so set class has uh, three useful arguments. One is the name of the new class that you're creating. Um, the second is uh, the slots that you'd like to put in into the class for data. And then the third is a prototype. So it's a uh, default values for each slot. Um, so that's optional. We didn't do that in that first example, but it's good to do this because then you can, um, when a class is instantiated, it will automatically check the data that you're trying to put into the class against these, uh, those prototypes. And if they don't fit, then it won't work. Actually, I'm sorry, it's checking it against the, uh, checking it against the, the uh, slots and it's using the prototypes to populate if you don't provide a slot when you're in staging in a class. Um, so now in this case, we're uh, um, assigning the output of this to, uh, okay, so we're assigning the output of this to person again, like we did initially. Um, so um, yeah, so we're creating a, uh, a person with name Brett and then looking at the structure of that you can see that it's put in NA for um, age and um, Brett for the name. Um, yeah, so again, it's something I'd like to talk about a little bit more later, but this is um, creating the um, D 
the instantiation function using set class and assigning set class. Um, it seems like, from the reading I've done about it, it seems like a good idea. Um, it's essentially, you know, what you're, if you've worked in other languages, it's often what you see as an instantiator or a, uh, a way to create an instance. Um, and I think that it actually does, it'll include whatever validation that you program in uh, behind the scenes, but that part I haven't tested yet. Um, okay. Okay, so inheritance, S4 classes uh, have inheritance kind of baked into them. And the way this works is uh, there's a contains argument to set class um, that tells it, um, it tells it what class you're 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 inheriting from. Um, so you can say, uh, let's make an employee class. Uh, it contains um, the classes from person, but then it also adds a slot for your boss, which is in turn another uh, person class object. Um, and we're giving it a prototype, um, and then we are going to um, test it by creating a new instance of it. And you can see what it's done is it's it's got three slots, uh, boss, and then name and age. So the name and age come from this uh, um, this inheritance, and then the uh, um, the boss is another um, nested object of class person, and that's why it has this name and age uh, nested inside of it. And also, I think I can't remember if I said this at the beginning. I am by far not an expert in OOP, so if I get anything wrong, please stop me and correct me. Um, okay, so looking at uh, how inheritance works. Um, so you can look at what classes an object inherits from with the is function. Um, say, uh, so if we say is of new person, it'll just give us person because it's just that person class that we initially created. Um, and if we say uh, um, is of, of uh, employee instance, it'll say, okay, well, this is uh, um, a class employee, but it inherits from class person. And you can do the similar thing by uh, to test um, test where you're get where you're getting your class from. You can say like is poo of class person. If you said um, is new uh, is new employee of class person. I'm actually not sure what happened with that. I think no. Okay. Um, all right. So helpers. So uh, just like with the other object oriented methods, it's a good idea to create a, a constructor that's user facing. Um, and in this case, we're going to use the, the same person function, but instead of automatically assigning it out of, uh, um, um, bleh, sorry, writing my names and things, out of set class, um, we are going to uh, create a new function that, that creates a, an object of class person. Um, we can give it sensible defaults. We can say we want the age to be, to be uh, default NA if you don't provide one. You're required to put in a name for this uh, for this new person. Um, you can uh, say, okay, well, the age has to be um, a double or coercible to a double. Um, and then the final act of a uh, of a uh, constructor should be to actually create the object and you can use the new function for that. Um, oops, sorry, extra scroll. Um, Okay, and as you'd expect, if you instantiate a, uh, um, a person with the name Poo, it'll uh, give it the name Poo and nothing in the age slot. Um, okay, you can also create validators. Um, so, if you think about it, we've we've told this we've told this object that it needs to be a uh, age needs to be uh, a numeric, but it doesn't really say much more about that. And since every since there are no scalars in R, um, you can you know, there's no reason why you couldn't put in a vector of ages. Um, but if you think about it, your person shouldn't have a vector of ages. Your person should have one age. Um, but by default, there's no prevention for this. So this is why we need a validator function. Uh, we can use the, uh, um, the methods package function set validity. Um, and this creates a, a test behind the scenes for whether the object is valid. Um, and so you're saying uh, um, for, the, for the person class, um, use this function to test whether it's valid. And in this case, it's uh, um, if the length of the of the name that you're, that of the object is not the same as the length of the age, i.e. if there's more ages than names, 
um, then something's wrong and you can't can't have an object that looks like that. Um, and um, yeah, so it'll return true if it's a valid object and we'll return this error if it's, a, uh, um, if it's not a valid object. So you can see now that when we try to instantiate a uh, poo object, sorry, a, uh, a person object named poo um, or a person object with poo as the name and a, um, and a range of ages, it'll tell us that it's invalid. Um, and you, you can see here that we haven't added anything to our constructor. So um, we're still using this constructor, but now the new function just kind of knows that it has to use that validator. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting about this. And I think that is why the, um, the uh, uh, making, a, making a constructor directly with the, uh, um, the new object function works. Okay. All right. So now what do we do with these objects? Um, so, now, <clears throat> so now it's into the object or the uh, functional part of the, of the uh, object orientation of, of S4. So um, for this, just like with S3, we use generics. So a generics jobs or method dispatch, i.e. find the specific implementation um, for the classes passed to the generic. Um, so we're going to create a new S4 generic with set generic as we saw earlier. Um, that it's a, it's, has a function that calls standard generic, which just generates this, this standard generic uh, function behind the scenes. Um, and then the, uh, um, the other part of this is, um, is the signature. So by default, when you use uh, set generic, it will use every, uh, everything passed to this function as to do dispatch on. So if you have a function that does um, x comma y comma z, then it'll look at the classes of x, y, and z unless you tell it to do differently. Um, that may be what you want. It may be that uh, y and z can be any class, and it doesn't doesn't really matter. And you'll and you'll test for whether they're the, they're the right data format later or something like that. So in that case, you can define what arguments are used for the as the function signature uh, with the signature argument. So, um, so how to assign methods to the generics? Uh, we use set, set method, and there are three important arguments here. There's the name of, gen, of the generic, um, the name of the class that's going to be uh, dispatched on this, and the, uh, the method itself, which is the definition of just the, the function that defines the method. So uh, for what we set up in the last slide, we could say, okay, for, uh, um, for my generic, which is the generic that we just created. Um, if you see something of the person class um, calling that function, um, calling the my generic function, uh, use this use this function body to um, to handle that. Okay, and you'll see that increasingly as the presentation goes on, there are notes like this that the uh, um, signature can include multiple arguments. This makes method dispatch substantially more complicated. Um, S4 gives you basically unlimited power of dispatch, but and unlimited power of inheritance. But when you combine those two, you end up with a system that can be kind of make things more complicated with the intention of making things less complicated. If that makes any sense. Okay, so um, so now we have some methods. How do we how do we tell what methods are being uh, dispatched and things like that? Okay, so. We can look at uh, uh, methods belonging to a generic by using the methods function and uh, um, the generic name, and that'll list all the methods. We haven't really defined any methods, so it hasn't uh, hasn't given us anything back from this. Uh, but if we do this on our our uh, um, ah, okay, so and the other way to call methods is uh, uh, if you give it a class argument, uh, it will list all the methods for that class. And you can see these are the two methods that we defined earlier on: the uh, the age assign the age age accessor function and the uh, age setter function. Um, okay. And then uh, to, um, okay, to define, to find an implementation of the specific method, use uh, select method uh, with the generic in the class. Um, so this will give you the actual method that's going to be used for, for this combination of, of elements. Um, so, uh, for my generic 
person, you can see that we've it returns this function that um, does nothing, <laughs> which is because we didn't assign anything to that to do. Um, and you can look at the arguments to that function using the args of the of uh, uh, get generic for the generic function you're interested in. Okay, and then uh, uh, sorry, just oh, yeah, sorry. just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, that means the methods with brackets class person does not find my generic connection. So one slide before, you have the methods class person and it only shows you age and uh, age with the thing, but not yes. the my generic person. Oh, uh, um... it does not show right. you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're oh. right. Yeah. Um, I think that might, I need to check it, but I think that might be something in my presentation. Oh, um, okay. Okay. I, I occasionally would evaluate, I, I occasionally wouldn't evaluate things to, to not have the output clog stuff up. So let me, let me check that. Don't take that as, as something defined by the code. Yeah. No, I, I just, because that, that's what I was missing in the, in the first uh, one object on the program, because that's a good thing, I think, like, um, you could check what's or what you can all do with one class, like. Yeah, like those are it, the parts that are really useful for you know a user to know. Yeah, I'll I'll check that when we're done and make sure because that's that would be yeah that's useful to know whether that's uh, that's just my my slide presentation or not. Um, okay. Okay, so um, so up until now we've been creating new generics, um, but one of the most common things for an object will be to assign methods for the commonly used generics, and the most commonly used one it, for S four is show. Um, show is essentially, and hopefully I got this right, is essentially the S four equivalent of print. Um, so when we initially uh, when we initially printed our object, I'm just going to scan back really quick here. Um, so when we initially um, printed our object, we got this output, this uh, object of class person um, slots and, and all that stuff. So let's say we'd like to have a nicer print output for our, our, our person object. So we can set a method for the show function, the show generic. Uh, for our person object, and we can say, okay, well, let's let's do some nice pretty printing for this. And now, once we've done that, you can see that when we uh, print poo, we get this nice little output that just shows that it's a person that has name and age. Um, and you know, you can do similar things like this for this uh, summary generic. Um, you know, there's a bunch of bunch of commonly assigned generics. Um, okay, so dispatch. This is where things get beyond my brain power to, uh, to decipher, um, but I will try. Okay, so uh, um, S4 dispatch is complicated because it um, is very flexible in two kind of two axes. One is multiple inheritance, inheritance i.e. a class can have multiple parents. Uh, the second is multiple dispatch, i.e. a generic can use multiple arguments to pick a method. method. So it makes it really powerful, but it can also get hard to understand how R is picking a method for a given call. Um, so basically, the solution to this is to think it out beforehand when you're designing uh, when you're designing classes and, and assigning methods, and secondly, to keep it as simple as possible. Um, try to avoid multiple inheritance and reserve dis multiple dispatch for only when you need to dispatch differently based on the what the arguments are. Um, and in the book, Hadley uses this nice uh, um, emoji graph system to um, describe this. Um, so basically, the, uh, um, the emojis are are uh, inheriting from what's upstream of them, what the arrow points to. So a, a, a smoochy cat inherits from a cat emoji, which inherits from a cat something or other. And a cat emoji inherits from emoji face and cat. So. And I'm glad this is simple and funny because it gets really complicated really fast. Okay, so sing, a single dispatch. Uh, so what happens when you have a, uh, um, a function that's um, calling um, 
uh, winky, winky tongue out smiley face. Um, and you need to pick a method for winky tongue out smiley face. Um, so it's going to go up the chain of inheritance. So winky smiley face, winky tongue out smiley face inherits from winky smiley face, which inherits from emoji face. Um, then it's going to say, okay, well, um, I don't have a method for for uh, a winky tongue out smiley face. I don't have a method for uh, uh, for winky smiley face, but this gray indicates that we do have a method available for the the basic emoji face. So that's what it's going to execute for this um, for this diagram. Um, so that makes sense, like the the uh, function parts on the top and the the method graphs on the bottom. Um, okay. So multiple inheritance. So this is when a class has two parent classes. So in this case, um, so the top part is the function you're calling. You're calling a function on uh, smiley sunglasses face. Um, and so you're trying to track down what method to use for that for that object class. Uh, so smiley sunglasses face uh, inherits from smiley face, which inherits from just emoji. Um, and it also inherits from sunglasses. So it's going to look down both of these paths to see, see what method it should call. And the, the heuristic it uses is to pick the closest method. Um, so in this case, if there was a method available at um, you know, emoji, emoji face and sunglasses, it would pick sunglasses because sunglasses is only one step away from the, from the actual class that's, that the method is being called on. Um, all right. So not too bad so far. Um, okay, so if no if no method can be found, all right. I need to move my my zoom bar. Can't see anything. Ah, there we go. If no method can be found, it would be highlighted with a red double outline. Um, and if methods are the same distance, they'll make the the parent ambiguous with this dashed outline. So in this case. Uh, you end up with an ambiguous method. Uh, so what happens then? Um, the methods are the same distance apart. So this is a bad situation because what R does is it picks the method alphabetically, which should be considered for all intents and purposes as random. So you want to avoid this in your code because it's not, it's, your intention is not clear. Um, All right, so you can see how this gets pretty complicated immediately by this example. Um, so it's the same one we've been working with with uh, smiley sunglasses face, um, but we're we're looking at the six possible combinations of available methods to to do this. Um, and there's only one that works really well. So in this first case, I, I might be misunderstanding this slightly. So uh, um, I always have to remind myself of the red. The uh, um, red means no method can be found. Um, so for this first one, it's looking back up the chain and there's a method available for smiley face and a method available for uh, um, sunglasses face, but none for the, the ultimate parents. So I don't see why this wouldn't just call the sunglasses face method because that's the, the you know, that's unambiguously the method that's for the uh, sunglasses face object. I, I think the sunglasses is never set. So the sunglasses, um, so um, there's no method for sunglasses at all. Huh? Oh, okay. Or maybe I do not understand it. Yeah, I think there might be something I'm, I'm missing here because so gray box is supposed to be a, a class with the method available. Um, any case, we can think about that a little bit. We can, we can run through the rest of the diagram. Um, so in this case, you've got uh, um, you know this far away, nothing for here. Um, in this case, you've only got a method for sunglasses and none for uh, for this parent. Um, likewise, you've only got methods for for these parents and not for sunglasses. Um, this one is a is an ambiguous method because there's two methods available that are the same distance away from the from the object. Um, and then the one that's unambiguous and and really clear and has the least number of methods to find for all of these cases is I think I think that's what he's saying with the with the gray. So even though these define a, um, a dispatch for this specific case, 
it's not the least number of defined methods to to handle this kind of graph of, of object types or of classes, sorry. Um, but so this final one, um, there's a method defined for sunglasses. There's a method defined for um, basic emoji. Um, basic emoji is further away than sunglasses. So we're going to use the method for sunglasses for sunglasses smiling face. Um, OK, so then that was inheritance. This is dispatch. Um, so now we've got a more complicated function graph because we are looking at both the first argument to a function and the second argument to a function and the the inheritance for each of those each of those uh, um, arguments. So for um, doing a function of uh, uh, tongue out winky smiley tongue out winky smiley face um, and tongue out winky smiley face, we're going to look down the path for the, both of those. Um, and I think the point of this is that it kind of comes back together that, you know, if you just had a method defined um, for um, basic emoji face and, you know, you just have one method defined for basic emoji face, the parent for this function comes back to that. Um, I, I think that's the point of that. So if you, but if you had like a a function that called uh, winky smiley face and tongue out smiley face and those objects were different enough that they required you know a different dispatch then i think you'd yeah that would get more complicated uh, but why couldn't it be the middle one the middle one oh this one no the middle one because this the one. middle one uh, has also both the same and there's just one level higher than the last one well, so so if you were if you were def if you were trying to define the least number of methods that would make this method graph work or this object this uh, this dispatch graph work, you would define one method here. So if you define one method here, that would work for this one. Actually, would it? Um, I'm trying to think. So. Yeah, that's a good question. This is where it gets confusing to me. So this one, if if the winky face method works for um, tongue out winky face, then yes, if there was a method defined here, that would work for, for this dispatch. And I think that's what it would pick. Oh, he, I think he shows in the next image. So you maybe have it. Yeah. OK. So the difference between multiple inheritance, multiple dispatch is that there are many more arrows to follow. Um, so this is the, um, there are four defined methods and there are two ambiguous cases. So yeah, so it's the same rule for method dispatch. So for this one, um, it's gonna look upstream. There's a method available um, equidistant. So it's ambiguous which method will be chosen for this. Um, and same thing for this one. There's a method that's that's equidistant, um, so it's gonna it's it's gonna be ambiguous which method it chooses. Um, so it it probably if you let it run, it would use one of the two at the lower level. That's a good question. So because because it looks did it cannot find anything anymore. And then if two, two ambiguous, um, if the decision is between two amb ambiguous ones, it will use more or less uh, alphabetically or something like this. Yeah, so, so here, um, whether it picks the method that's assigned to um, winky smiley face and tongue out winky smiley face, or whether it picks the method that's assigned to um, tongue out smiley face and winky smiley face is going to be arbitrary. It's going to be just by alphabetically which method name is first. Yeah, but um, but will it use this one which you show now or the bottom ones? Oh, whether it'll continue on down the chain. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure if it stops at the first method or if it will keep on going down the chain. You know, I mean, another, you know, if, and this is starting to sound really silly, if, if emojis are transitive, um, then, uh, is that the right word? I think so. Um, if, mo if emojis are transitive, then both of these methods are identical anyway. Um, yeah, but I think that's, 
you cannot write it like this because I think that's the same with the plus. So when, when we looked at the plus, it also said left and the right side. So you have to define the left and right side. Right, because all functions are not transitive. You can't, you can't, I don't think there's a way to define that, that, that this is transitive. Um, I think. <laughs> yeah, I don't it, it would have been it would have been nice to have a uh, um, kind of a real world example with something like the the plus operator. Um, you, you could have done some. <laughs> yeah, like I, I should have done one for this. I'm assuming that the plus operator, you know, so if you um, you could imagine that that's like a perfect case for for multiple dispatch. So if you have um, you know a, a day of the week plus one. Um, then there's a correct way to interpret that. And if you have a day of the week, uh, oh, if you have one plus a day of the week, um, you know, you could argue that, okay, yes, you should dispatch that the same way because plus should be transitive. Um, or you could argue that one plus a day of the week doesn't make any sense. And multiple dispatch gives you the ability to make those decisions in your code, I guess is the, the outcome of all this. Um, and if this wasn't complicated enough already, oh, oh no, I didn't put in the final ones. In the in the book, there's a couple of uh, um, truly messy uh, multiple dispatch plots that are the reason not to use multiple dispatch with uh, multiple inheritance at the same time. But in words, um, you can kind of see that, like, you know, in in those series of slides, things just get more and more complex the more elements you add into them. So at some point, you're losing the benefit of of uh, not repeating yourself. Um, the, the, the benefit of not repeating yourself is outweighed by the benefit of complexity of your of your dispatch. Um, so at some point, it makes more sense to just say, OK, well, I know that there's, there's probably a way to make this inheritance work, but it's better just to tell it what to do. Um, you know, and that that'll that'll depend on on you and what you're programming and you know how you can if you can plot it out in a way that makes sense. Um, and I just like the old William of Ockham quote: uh, um, "Don't make things more complicated if you don't need to." Um, which I found out during this apparently was uh, predates William of Ockham by about three hundred years. Um, anyhow, so the final bit of the chapter is on. Um, using S3 and S4 together. Um, so uh, um, the slots and contains of uh, S4 classes can be S4 classes, they can be S3 classes, um, or they can be an implicit class of, of base type, like we saw in the examples earlier on. Um, if you're going to use an S3 class, you need to register it with the settled class from the methods package. Um, so essentially what we're saying here is like, um, okay, um, for the class data frame, um, let S4 know about it. Um, but a better and more complete way to do this is to um, to provide a new definition for for the class. So you can say, okay, well, let's say I want to use the S3 class factor as an S4 class. So I'll say set class factor, um, and basically define it just like the S3 class is. Um, and at the end, I'll say set all class factor. Um, and with this extra argument that says, okay, the S4 class of this S3 class that we're, that we're assigning, that we're setting is, uh, is factor. And then uh, using S3 methods with S4 is another thing you might want to do. Um, so you can uh, either create new S4 generics or convert S3 generics to S4. Um, so here, uh, we're creating a new uh, S3, S4 generic uh, of the, um, called mean. Obviously mean exists already, and it is an S3 generic, I believe. Um, so uh, the existing function becomes the default any method. So the, um, the, uh, the S3 mean method, although actually that's a good question, um, which method for mean, because there's a bunch of them. Um, but in any case, so it becomes the, the, the default method for uh, the any class. Um, so we're going to look look at this after setting the setting generic mean. We're going to look at what what actually happened with select method. Um, so we look at the uh, um, 
the mean generic for the any class. Um, you can see it's the, the same as if you were to look at the mean function, use method mean, um, and the signatures are uh, anything for the target. Okay, I think that's all I've got. Yeah, this has been a whirlwind last couple of weeks for OOP. So this is definitely, I'm also, I'm trying to learn C-sharp at the same time for something. So it's actually been really helpful for that. Okay. So could we check if the methods thingy works? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me do that. Uh, Little bit bread live coding. I could do that. Uh, can't believe I'm still so slow at, at uh, Zoom after all this time. Okay. So let's see. Is that big enough? Looks good. Okay. All right, I'm trying to remember where we were. Now I can't remember where we had that, that error. It was in the, it was in the validator, right? Uh, I mean, it? you could just search for method um, and then class person. Sorry, say that again. You could just search for a method and then a class. Uh, you just write it here, yeah. Method, um, method, and then um, what? What's it called? Brackets? No, uh, exactly. And then class. Um, there's... No, I. I think you have to write uh, class. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Oh, it's methods with an S. With an S. Okay. Oh, okay. Then you. Might, I know I might have executed this stuff yet. You have, yeah. Yeah. Let me go back to my. Okay. Yeah, now I'm trying to remember where we had that issue. Ah, oh, here we go. Yep, the bell. Okay, no, that's right. Um, I'm missing where we had the issue. I'm just going to subtract the presentation quickly. I, I think it's it's coming up, so okay. you can't you can't be that far away. Oops. Okay. Yeah, no. That makes it, sense with the error. Okay, here you said the generics. Yeah. Yeah. Set it to generic. Setting the method. Okay. Uh, this was this was it. The eval falls here. Okay. Oh, okay. So it's in there. Yeah. So it's cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we are getting the two, uh, the three methods. We're getting the age, the age. Yeah. This is where it was. Um, so it did it did assign uh, the method for my generic to uh, to class person. 
So that's probably a great for users because when you now have an uh, instance of an S4, you can simply check with methods what uh, options um, uh, are for you there. Yeah, so yeah, so you can see what methods are available. And it's also nice because you can just assign a new method to something if, you know, as a user. Um, you know, which I guess is kind of the point of OOP is that you can, um, yeah, you can extend it easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that that's what I really like about the about the dis the dispatch way of doing things. And again, like I'm not a I'm not an OOP person, so I could be completely missing this. But um, you know, the dispatch method, as opposed to the encapsulation encapsulation method, means that you know, oh, I see there's a you know a, a data type from this package that doesn't have a, a good print method um, or doesn't have a good plot method. So I can just, you know, tack on a method in my own code to to plot this data the way I want it to. Um, you know, and, and it's flexible because instead of having to create a totally new print function for that class, I can just tack it onto the old one or onto the or onto the plot function or whatever, plot generic, whatever. I mean, I know what you want to say there, but in my opinion, it's also fair game to create um, a child which inherits the parent and then, uh, so it's more clean, I think, but yeah. It's... Yeah, same idea, except it keeps everything encapsulated, which you could argue is e easier to interpret. So if you make a, yeah, yeah. if you inherit a method, if you inherit a class, and then define a new method for the in that inherited class. Um, sorry, in the in the new class um, with the inherited stuff from the old class. That yeah. Uh, and I look the double dispatch thingy up. Um, you you have to set both things actually, so both directions. But of course, there are packages which are mentioned by Hartley like which helps you that you don't have to set both directions more or less. So something that'll do that for you kind of automatically. Yeah, it's it's something arithmetic. So it's probably only good for arithmetic stuff.